And welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time. This is for Tuesday, September 26th, 2023. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me uh, today. And if you want to get your Bibles and open them up, we'll be starting in the 40th Psalm. And then we'll go to the 132nd and 133rd Psalm, 2 Kings 8, and we'll finish it out in John chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 40. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it pops up. And so you can be notified whenever content's added to the channel. And don't forget to comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. And open, as you're opening your Bibles, I will go into the postage stamp or opening your Bible app, whichever it is that uh, you happen to do. Okay. Should be all set now. Psalm 40. And we'll, let's begin. Faith preserving in trial to the chief musician, the Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God, many will see it in fear, and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust, and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It, it, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know, you yourself know. I have not hidden, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than hairs of my head, therefore my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor, who wish me evil. Let them be confounded because of their shame. Woe, uh, who say to me, Aha, aha. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Now we'll go to Psalm 132. Psalm 132, the eternal dwelling of God in Zion, a song of ascents. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard it. We heard of it in if in Ephrathah, another one I can't pronounce very well. We found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and the let Lord your saints has sworn shout truth to David. He will not for turn your from servants, it. David, I will say, set upon do not throne throne away the fruit of your of body. Your anointed. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests. 
uh, with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown will flourish. Psalm 133. A blessed unity of the people of God, a song of ascent of David. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commands the blessing life forevermore. Now we'll go over to 2 Kings chapter 8. So the king here is going to restore the Shunammites' land, and this is well, this is like reading the history of most any nation. There's wars and all kinds of problems here, and we can see how the problems with Israel had to do with the fact that they just didn't do what God told them to do in the first place. Uh, they could have avoided a lot of the troubles they got into if they just would have done that. So 2 Kings 8, the, then Elisha spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go, you and your household, and stay wherever you can, for the Lord has called for a famine, and furthermore it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and dwelt in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the end of seven years that the woman returned to the land, or returned from the land of the Philistines, and she went to make an appeal to the king for her house and for her land. Then the king talked with uh, uh, Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, please, all the great things Elisha has done. Now it happened as he was telling the king how he had restored the dead to life, that there was the woman whose son he had restored to life and appealing to the king for her house and for her land, and Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed a certain officer for her, saying, Restore all that was hers, and all the proceeds of the field from the day that she left of the land until now. Then Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazel, Take a present in your hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? So Hazel went to meet him, and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, forty camel loads. And he gave and stood before him, and said, your son Ben-Hadad, king of Assyria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? And Elisha said to him, uh, Go say to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Then he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. And Hazel said, Why is my Lord weeping? And he answered, Because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire, and their young men you will kill with the sword, and you will dash their children and rip open their women with child. So Hazel said, But what is your servant, a dog, that he should do this gross thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you will become king over, Assy over Syria. Then he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? And he answered, he told me you would surely recover, but it happened on the next day that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it over his face so he died, and Hazel reigned in his place. So this is what happens sometimes when you're king. Somebody else wants the job, and they'll sort of uh, help you get transferred, shall we say, uh, out of the organization? Because that's what happened here. Obviously, he took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, and smothered the king. And then I don't know how the line of succession exactly worked or if he had to bump off other people. But this uh, Hazel then reigned in his place and became king. And it's uh, not going to go well for Israel. So verse 16. Now in the fifth year of uh, Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, having been king of Judah, uh, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, began to reign as king of Judah. 
And he was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Wait a minute, I've heard that before somewhere. Evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, that describes a lot of the kings. And I think even today, that would describe a lot of world leaders. I'm not going to mention any names right now, or political affiliations, or any such thing. But uh, we've got some uh, world leaders now that are doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David, as he had promised him to give a lamp to him and his sons forever. In his days... Edom revolted against Judah, against Judah's authority, and made a king over themselves. So Joram went to Zair and all his chariots with him. Then he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who were who had surrounded him, and the captains of the chariots and the troops fled to their tents. Thus Edom had been in revolt against Judah's authority to this day. And Libna revolted at that time. Now the rest of the acts of Joram and all they that he did, uh, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Joram rested with his fathers and, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Haziah, his son, reigned in his place. And in the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Haziah, the son of Joram, the king of Judah, began to reign. And Haziah was twenty-two years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Athel, Athelaiah, the granddaughter of Omri, the king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab, and did evil in the sight of the Lord, and like the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And you notice all these roads leading back to Ahab. And remember, what a, I mean, he won a few battles, yeah, but overall he was a pretty evil king, and his wife was even worse than he was. Now he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against uh, Hazel, king of Syria. At Ramoth, Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram. And the king, and then King Joram went back to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which the Syrians had inflicted on him at Ramah, when he fought against uh, Hazel, the king of Syria. And Hazai, the son of, Jeho of, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, uh, in Jezreel because he was sick. And that leaves that as kind of a cliffhanger. And now we'll go on to John chapter 6. Now the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Mark records a feeding also of a 4,000. Uh, so there's two of them, two two separate instances, okay? They weren't weren't the same. Not that somebody, It's this is not one of those, somebody got numbers mixed up, referring to two different instances. So after these things, John chapter 6, uh, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up uh, on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So, okay, Philip, here's a question for you. I know it's not a trick question, but how are we going to feed these people? So Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among the many? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting uh and the disciples to those sitting down. So he gives it to the disciples, disciples pass it around. Likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up all the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then these men, uh, who were, uh, when they said, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, 
said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, someone once pointed out to me that some of these people are following Jesus just for the loaves and the fish. You know, they just are hungry. They just want to eat. But you notice he fed them anyway. And I uh, take that approach many times in ministry. There are going to be people who come around to the church just because they need a handout. Well, let's help them. Now, this is where some discernment has to come in because there are going to be people out there that are scam artists. And if you come across something that is obviously a scam, then don't participate in it. But it would be better to err and give someone some groceries uh, if that's what they need. And then later find out they were scamming then to say, no, we're not going to help you, only to find out later it was a legitimate uh, need that we were dealing with. Uh, so and that also brings up the issue that's kind of getting a little bit off topic here, but a little bit of the issue of money. Most churches I know have a policy. We don't give money, period. Now, if it's a member that or somebody that we know on a case by case basis, we might uh, give a little bit of money. If we do decide to help someone financially, say they need rent money, then typically we give the money straight to the landlord. Uh, we write a check or take cash to the landlord and get a receipt for it. Uh, that way we know it's going where it's supposed to uh, instead of uh, here, you know, we'll give you $500 for your rent and then they go and blow it on booze or something else. So, uh, but it is a congregational uh, decision whether or not to help, just like me individually. There are some people that I won't help and then there are some people that I don't mind helping. So anyway... Uh, verse 15, verse 15, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountains by himself alone. He was not coming for an earthly kingdom. This should really refute the idea that Jesus came to establish some kingdom on earth or he's going to establish a kingdom on earth. His kingdom is not of this world or here was a perfect opportunity uh, to make him king and it would have been the opportunity to really uh, take it to the Romans. But that's not why he came. He was not the social revolutionary trying to start some new political or social justice movement. Uh, the progressive Christians have really done a disservice to the gospel uh, by lowering Jesus to some kind of community organizer type. Uh, they are doing a disservice. Well, they're doing a, an eternal disservice to the people who follow them. And if you're in some kind of a, first of all, define your terms, find out what they mean by progressive, find out what their beliefs are. And I've got a, a um, couple of videos in my uh, two cents worth uh, section that'll help you ask some questions. Uh, but if you're in a church that tries to make the Bible, oh, it's uh, some myth and uh, Jesus really didn't rise from the grave and any of that sort of thing, get out. Okay. You're not dealing with a Christian. You're dealing with a social club that's probably at its heart more atheist than anything else. But verse 16, now when the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing, so when they had rowed out three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land where they were going. And on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one which the disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, however, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they had bread after the Lord had given thanks. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into the boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. So here he's told them, you were just following me for the breads and the and the for the loaves and the fish. But do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has sent his seal on him. 
So he is using this as an opportunity to teach, not to chastise them for following him just for the, the bread, uh, the loaves and the fish. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered them uh, and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who sent uh, him. He sent. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of, of God is he who uh, uh, comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So that is the end of the reading for today. So let's go and have our prayer time to close it out. So for Tuesday, our prayer topics are pray for the church, uh, pray for your local congregation, and for Christians throughout the world. Now it's getting... Even in America, it's getting a little more dangerous for Christians. Uh, so we need to really be praying for one another and also be praying for opportunities to uh, share the gospel with people. So let's go to God in prayer. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. Thank you for another day of life. We want to pray, Lord, for uh, your people, wherever they are. Pray for Christians uh, to stand firm, Lord. Help us to stand firm for your truth. Help us, Lord, to... Present the truth to people so that they can see it and that they can accept it and believe on Jesus, Lord. And we want to pray for local congregations, a congregation where I minister. Pray for it to uh, be the light that it needs to be here in this community and pray for people to uh, the, pray for the members here, Lord, to uh, be on the lookout for those who would be seeking Jesus. Help us to see the, the hearts and souls that are searching, Lord, so that we can uh, teach them the gospel, teach them your truth, teach them what they need to do in order to be saved. And we pray for the church and uh, other nations, Lord, where they are being persecuted uh, in uh, North Korea, Arabia, Yemen, uh, most countries, Lord, out there where they are restrictions on freedoms of religion. We just pray for the for the Christians, Lord, to be able to conduct the work that they need to do so that they can win souls and help us all, Lord, to win souls, help us, Lord, to be thinking souls and to be the examples that we need to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you for uh, being here. And if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section below or send them to me at 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. Be glad to answer them uh, for you uh, in one of the formats here on the channel. That's going to wrap it up for today. Have a great day. We'll see you in the next video. I'm out.